We will now proceed to consideration of Resolution 107A. The Chair recognizes Stephen Salzburg of the District of Columbia from the Criminal Justice Section for purposes of moving the resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am Stephen Salzburg of the Criminal Justice Section, and I do move the adoption of 107A. Second. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen of the House, this is a simple resolution. Let me tell you a little bit about where it came from. We had a criminal justice section council meeting, and a couple of the members said that they were upset and shocked by the fact that in certain jurisdictions in this country, juveniles, 10, 12, 13 years old, were routinely brought into court shackled for purposes of juvenile proceedings. Some of them weren't even juvenile offense proceedings. They were status proceedings. And we said, this can't be right. And we looked into it and we discovered it is right. Um, it turns out that the issue about shackling was dealt with long ago, and our report addresses this. When Blackstone wrote, I hate to quote Blackstone because, you know what, some people say, well, did you know him? And no, the answer is no, <laughs> really didn't. But Blackstone wrote, this is true in the 18th century. We're talking about 1700s. At the time, that this country was founded. At the time we adopted a Bill of Rights, Blackstone wrote that in England, after you were indicted for the highest offense, the default was you could not be brought to court in chains or irons. That offended the presumption of innocence and the dignity of human beings. Our Supreme Court has discussed this again and again, most recently in Deck versus Missouri in 2005, and said it rises to the due process level that courts are places where we don't shackle people. We don't bind their ankles and chain their arms and treat them as animals unless it's absolutely necessary. That was the English principle. And let me tell you a little bit what this resolution does. It creates a presumption that juveniles ought to get the same protection as adults. They ought not to be shackled unless it's necessary, unless there's no other way to assure that the judicial proceedings are kept safe and that the juvenile won't escape. That's what this does. So let me answer your questions. Does it say you can't shackle? No. Does it say that a juvenile shouldn't generally be shackled? Yes. Who does it give the authority to a judge? And I want you to know we did remove the words in person from the resolution so that the juvenile, the issue, should the juvenile be shackled or not, very often is addressed by lawyers talking to the judge so that the issue can be resolved before the juveniles ever brought to court. Now, we have opposition to this resolution today, and let me address what I believe the opposition will be. Um, and let me address it this way. In order to understand juvenile justice and criminal justice, you have to take a look at what happens to people when the process begins. And here's what happens. They are arrested. And when they're arrested, they are handcuffed. And when they're handcuffed, their hands are placed behind their back and they're placed in a squad car where the handles don't open from inside and they can't get out no matter what. And then they're booked and then they're processed. And then if they are detained, they are shackled very often. And when they're brought to court, they are shackled. And I left out one thing, when they're detained, the jail cell clangs in that same kind of clang you see in the movies. Most, you know, recent, not recently, but most loudly in the movie The Fugitive. When the cell clangs, everybody knows they are no longer free. If a juvenile needs to get the message that it's serious business, when you commit an offense, even a juvenile offense, they get the message when they're handcuffed. They get the message when they're booked. They get the message when they're put in that cell and that jail cell clangs shut. They get the message when they are handcuffed, when they are leg cuffed and brought to court. The other message we suggest they should get is when they actually appear before a judge in judicial proceedings, that that's where they're treated with some dignity until they show they're not entitled to it. Every juvenile in America is entitled to the same human dignity as every adult in America. And there's not a court in this country that can justify routinely dragging juveniles before them in shackles to send them a message somehow that they need to be taught a lesson. They either get the lesson when they're arrested, when they're handcuffed, when they're jailed, and when they're hauled into court, or they're never gonna get that message. But there's another message they should understand. 
that courts of law are also teaching institutions, that the rule of law belongs not just to the judge, not just to the prosecutor, belongs to every individual, including those who are hauled before that court as a defendant. And I ask you, stand up for Blackstone. Stand up for what our Supreme Court has turned into a due process issue. Say no to the routine shackling of juveniles when they're brought before courts in the United States. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world that we regard as our equals in terms of justice. It's wrong, and it's time this country, long, long, long ago, this country should have stopped it. And we're asking you to adopt policy that would say, stop it today. Please support this resolution. Thank you, Professor Salzberg. The chair recognizes Lee Bussart of Tennessee, delegate from the Young Lawyers Division, to speak in opposition to Resolution 107A. Good morning. My name is Lee Bussart, and I am the juvenile judge for Marshall County, Tennessee. Um, I rise today in opposition to 107A, um, and, and I do respect the, and appreciate the thought and effort that has gone into this resolution, and I um, concur with Professor Salzberg in many respects. However, I must speak and tell you of my personal professional experience in this area. I do not speak on behalf of my state or my division or my conference only for myself to say that it is rare, as stated in the report, it is rare that juveniles are brought to court in shackles. But in those rare circumstances, I think the presumption should be in favor of restraint instead of against it. There are certainly needs for exceptions in medical circumstances and others case by case. However, restraint is necessary, and I will tell you it is because it works. I'm very privileged to have the time to meet with each of my juveniles as they are discharged from custody or probation. And at that meeting, we punctuate their experience so that they can move forward and try and avoid the courthouse from time um, in the future. At that meeting, I sit with their parents and we discuss what was the best part and what was the worst part of this experience for them. I cannot tell you the number of times that these juveniles will say to me when I sat there in court with those shackles and when I was um, treated like a criminal. I woke up and said, this isn't who I am and I'm not gonna behave in a way that gets me back here. I'm not going back down this road. Um, when the goal of your court is rehabilitation, and you hear that not once, not anecdotally, but time and time again, I must stand and tell you, it works. It works. Furthermore, it is necessary. This is not the time of Blackstone. These are real dangerous, serious offenses. And you cannot underestimate the risk of confronting a young person who is scared unfamiliar with the system, and not familiar with consequences. You cannot underestimate that risk. The report speaks that shackles are unfair because attorneys and judges um, might be shocked by the uh, appearance of someone who had been in detention. And I think that is a very uh, unfair assessment of our profession. I think that each of us in this room and each uh, licensed attorney would certainly not judge a person guilty or innocent based on their appearance or any shackle, outfit, or any other matter except the merits. It is certain that due process must be preserved. However, why would we give juveniles a greater right of due process than anyone else? I stand in opposition to 107A because I will say to you, it is very rare that I find a common thread of what works. And I study very hard how to reduce the recidivism rate in my court. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, um, placing them in detention for one night, putting them in shackles, is not meant to humiliate them. It is not meant to serve as a only wake up call I cannot tell you why. I can only tell you in my experience, it works. Thank you.
The chair recognizes Neil Arsonet of Florida, delegate from the criminal justice section, to speak in favor of Resolution 107A. Mr. Sonnet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, uh, <coughs> Your Honor, I greatly appreciate the fact that you have a court that obviously uh, is uh, working well. But yours is one court among hundreds and hundreds of juvenile courts throughout this country. And if you read the report that has been submitted with this resolution, and if you do the research that our folks did in looking at this on a national basis, you will find that the automatic shackling of juveniles is a national scandal. Now, I'm sure, Your Honor, that you're not saying that juveniles should automatically be shackled. And I'm sure you're not saying that you're not going to be respectful of their rights. But the automatic shackling of juveniles, particularly juveniles that are not in court for anything dangerous, but not even in some cases for a criminal offense, is simply wrong. It's contrary to law. And as our report points out, it's not only contrary to law, but it also interferes with the attorney-client relationship. It chills the notion of fairness and due process. It undermines the presumption of innocence, and it's contrary to the rehabilitative ideals of the juvenile court. Now, this resolution provides for a hearing. It doesn't say that all juveniles must be unshackled. It simply means that when a juvenile is in court, that juvenile, through counsel, has the right to apply to the court that the shackles be removed. And if the judge thinks that for that individual defendant, Your Honor, that the shackle should remain on for an hour or two, or even for a day, that's available for the judge to make a decision on. But the automatic shackling is what this resolution goes to. It's wrong. It's contrary to law. It's contrary to civil and human rights. And it ought to be stopped. That is what this resolution tries to deal with. And I think it deals with it fairly, and I think it's a resolution that needs your support. So I would urge you uh, to vote in favor of Resolution 107A. Thank you, Mr. Sonnet. The chair recognizes Jay Elliott of South Carolina, State Bar Delegate of South Carolina, to speak in support of Resolution 107A. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, it, it does bear mentioning that the uh, Young Lawyers Division, of which I would like to remain an honorary member, <laughs> supports the resolution. First, let's talk about what we mean when we talk about restraints. That puts the matter charitably. When these children are brought in in shackles, whether they're charged with disturbing schools something that we've all been guilty of, or a homicide, or burglary, whether it's their first offense, whether there is no evidence that this child has ever otherwise acted out in any fashion. That youngster is brought in in leg irons and belly chains. Yes, belly chains. Imagine being hogtied, only your hands are in front of you. That's what we're talking about. Now, let me tell you what happens when the chains come off in jurisdictions that have adopted these measures like North Carolina, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, North Dakota, New Mexico, Massachusetts. Nothing remarkable. Children don't bolt for the courthouse door. They do not go into conniptions. The courts do not slow to a glacial pace. And in fact, accused juveniles plead guilty at a rate of 95%. So nothing remarkable happens. Unless you count as remarkable the ability of a youngster 
as was described to me by a young public defender in South Carolina when the chains came off. The ability of the youngster to finally raise his hand to take the oath. Now, I understand that some people consider this a teachable moment, but remember, when you're brought, when you're, when you're accused and you're brought to the bar, you are presumed innocent while you're in pretrial status. Any punishment prior to trial is unconstitutional and a violation of rights, including the rights of the young. Now, when we have advocated either individually in court or as a part of a national campaign uh, to, to change law and policy in this area, we've alluded to the experts, the, the social sciences and the, uh, and, and the psychiatric and psychological sciences about the impact of this kind of practice on kids. But you know, it all distills to one immutable truth, which we know, and that is, if you treat a kid like an animal, that's what he becomes. Ladies and gentlemen, people in this country look to us for leadership about how to run courtrooms according to people who are brought to the bar, no matter who they are or what they've done, with dignity and respect. That's the hallmark of American jurisprudence. I ask you to continue to exercise leadership on this issue and signal to the nation's courts that, the, that, that people are to be treated with dignity and respect, including the youngest. The chair advises the House that she is holding no further salmon slips in opposition to Resolution 107A. The chair recognizes Bob Weeks, of California, delegate from the Santa Clara Bar Association to speak in favor, Mr. Weeks waves. The chair recognizes Sidney Butcher of Maryland, criminal justice section delegate, Mr. Butcher waves. Professor Salzberg, you wave your right to close. We will proceed to a vote. We are voting on 107A as revised as shown on the screen. All those in favor of adopting 107A as revised, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. 107A as revised is adopted.